coach, current football coach at Defiance College, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm sure it's going to be interesting. So please welcome. <laughs> Myself, uh, I, uh, I grew up in eastern Ohio, over uh, near Steubenville, just south of a little town called Shadyside, okay, on the Ohio River, mostly coal mining region, and, and uh, it takes care of the steel mills that are just a little north of us in Pittsburgh. So uh, it's big uh, football country. My father was, uh, he still lives in Shadyside. My mom is a longtime uh, head football coach and athletic director over there. If you're I, I grew up about a quarter mile from uh, Jerry Beauty, the head, who was the head football coach and now the AD at uh, Defiance High School, which is sort of funny when I first got here, he reached out and said, hey, you know, all these guys, he's a little older than I am, but I knew a lot of his coaches. In fact, I knew his high school coach real well as a buddy of my father. So uh, it was just sort of funny to come all the way here. And then Jim grew up in Wintersville, which is just up the river as well, you know, maybe 20 minutes, so not very far. So. Transplants um, here, and um, my uh, I went to uh, after high school. I went to Capital University in Columbus, uh, and uh, I graduated from there. And then was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles after that. And then I got after uh, jumping around uh, in the pros a little bit. I got into coaching, and um, I started out as a biology teacher. Uh, which was my degree at Barberton High School over near Akron, uh, which is where Bo Schembeck was from, so I grew up there. And um, when um, I finished there, then I started a, a full like, college coaching career. I coached at Kansas State. Um, I was at Hofstra in Long Island. I was the head coach at Emporia State in Kansas. And then uh, went to University of Wyoming as the offensive coordinator. Then I went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, where I was the assistant head coach. And then uh, then I was the head coach at Texas State University. And then I went. I was the offensive coordinator of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the Canadian Football League. Um, after that, I spent a little time in North Carolina at a little high school uh, for about three years. And then I got back in college coaching, was a head coach of a small college in Kansas, again, Bethany College, and then uh, went to Philadelphia, uh, Widener University, where I was the offensive coordinator. Our president at Defiance College at that time left Defiance and he went to Widener. He was the president of Jim Harris, who's now the president at University of San Diego. So that was sort of my understanding of Defiance. Even though I'm from Ohio, I've never been up this way. And then, um, then I'm here, and it's you know this is my 14th coaching job. My uh, f uh, this is my fifth time as a head football coach. Um, been very fortunate to be with some really good coaches, and uh, you know that have influenced me along the way. But how I got here is crazy. I mean, I I honestly I didn't apply for the job, right? Which which you think like how did you get this job if you didn't apply for it? Well, my little, my baby brother, I'm the oldest of four boys, he, uh, he actually played for me when I was head coach at Emporia State in Kansas. We were in Ohio, because both said, wait, I have a six-year-old, believe it or not, and I have two out of college, okay? And uh, our six-year-old, um, we were trying to get back to Ohio, because my wife is from Yellow Springs, uh, down near the uh, Springfield Dayton area, and so we, we wanted to be around both sets of grandparents, so about two years ago, I, said, I told my brother, I said, Louie, look, here's, here's the deal. If you ever see a job in Ohio open up, I'm gonna email, here's my resume, here's a cover letter, here's my Gmail account, just apply. And I was joking, and I said, just don't tell me. Next thing you know, it's the middle of July, and my phone rings, and it says Defiance, Ohio. Now, Norm, I'm thinking, it's, that's probably telemarketers, you know, it's like, who, who, but it's Ohio, so I'm thinking, let me check. And it was, at that time, the athletic director at, at the college and said, hey, Coach Matt Sackis, are you interested? Uh, we looked at all these resumes, and uh, would you like to fly out here tomorrow? 
<laughs> what? I, I didn't even know the job was open. And um, so I said, look, I'm at Chick-fil-A with my son, and uh, I'll, I'll call you after he's done, you know, in the playground area there, and, uh, and we'll talk. So I call her back up, and I say, hey, uh, yeah, Defiance, great. I had time to call my brother up in Lexington, and I said, what did you do? And he goes, oh, I forgot you said not to tell you. <laughs> oh, great, okay. So I, he, he said, it's the kind of job you would want. It's, they haven't really won very much. It's a lot of uh, opportunity for growth is what he said. And, he, and those are the kind of job, every head coaching job I've had has been just that, opportunity for growth, always turning around some program somewhere. And uh, so I called the AD back up. I said, all right, I'll fly out tomorrow. So I, my flight's supposed to leave from Philadelphia and go to Detroit. Problem was, we had these storms and they routed me through Charlotte, which, okay, fine. So I go through Charlotte and, and it goes from Charlotte to Toledo instead. There's a flight that is, I don't know, American. So there's a flight that, is, that always goes that way. So I'm sitting there on the plane and for some reason I had one of these, uh, like a bowl ring on, like from, you know, you get from playing on bowl games in college. And uh, these two guys are sitting behind me. And uh, they go, hey, uh, where, where, are you, where are you from? You know, because I can tell they were like football fanatics. You know, they see this, it's like, it's, it's like for guys, it's like eye candy, these like big diamond rings. It's like, oh, well, you know, where'd you coach? So we have this conversation and they go, well, why are you headed to Toledo? I got, you know, I'm interviewing for this job in a little town you've probably never heard of. You know, they go, well, try us. I said, well, it's Defiance College and the head coaching job there. And one guy goes, oh my gosh, I'm from Defiance. And the other guy goes, I'm from Napoleon. And I go, oh my. And now they, they proceed to single-handedly over about an hour conversation to sell me on Defiance College. I mean, they, they're one of their wives, one of their wives, the one from the podium is an alum and all this. So they're like selling it. I'm thinking, this place must be paradise. I mean, the way they're talking is that football's great in Northwest Ohio. I mean, you're gonna find players and it's a great town, a lot of little communities in the area. If you, once you, you know, if you can win there and get things going, it'll be an awesome place to raise your child. Well, wow, that was great. That's all I needed. And the funny thing is, on the interview here, when I talked to everybody, they never even showed me the town. They just, I was in like a couple boardrooms, and they thought that their wonderful personalities would sway me to come to Defiance College. It was actually these two guys on the airplane. That's what sold me, no doubt. So, and we ended up being, we're still friends from that moment, and all of a sudden, uh, they both came to our first game, my very first game here. And they, were, they flew up from North Carolina, where they live, and uh, to come to the game. So we're friends on Facebook. So you know we, so it's sort of neat uh, to get here. And um, when I took the job at the end of July, I literally a week later I uh, I had to move out here. So uh, it was August seventh. This is past August. So I move out here August seventh driving a U-Haul, and we got the cars already out here. So my wife, our, our six-year-old Eli, and we're coming out. I had not met the coaching staff. I had not met a player on the team. I didn't know, know, I didn't know a single soul. So we pull up to the house, which we were so lucky to get. I mean, we rented a house, because you can't find them. You know, we have a 160 pound Great Dane. You know, it's not like you know, anyone's gonna rent to you, but we're fortunate, lady. Uh, she had recently widowed and she had a house for rent and she was moving to California and said, if you're the head coach at Defiance College, you got, you've got the house. So, wow. So we found the house, we're pulling up and there's like 50 some players moving us into the, into the house, which is pretty cool. You know, so it's like, that's the first I'd met these guys. And, um, so that, that was, that was fun. Now, the not so fun part was once I got there, then I'm getting all this insight from the AD and the president, how, you know, we talked about this the year before, there were all kinds of issues with the national anthem and the American flag. And I'm like, oh, now you tell me, okay? And I, and I walked into this and it's like, okay, fine, we'll do what we need to do and we'll get this, you know, we'll, we'll teach them 
you know, how to do it right, you know. And, uh, and uh, that was, it, it took time because I'm their fourth head coach in four years. So there's not a lot of trust issue there. So the first thing we did was just get to know all these guys. And I knew we had like seven guys still on the team of the 17 guys that took a knee during the national anthem, right? And uh, so I knew they were on the team. I knew who they were, you know, the local uh, Bob Krager, who's now a good buddy of mine. He's, he runs, he's, he's part of the VFW over there. He had given me the pictures and told me the, the situation. We had coffee about half a dozen times. He called me today, you know, and, uh, and, and he explained what he saw and how it was on the news in Toledo. And uh, so um, the week before the first game, we're in a lecture hall with the team, you know, and it's like, okay, and next Saturday we have a home game. Right? And I just explained to them that uh, obviously there was an elephant in the room. I hadn't brought it up. I just wanted them, I just wanted to get to know these guys. So I asked them, I said, look, hey, um, how did it feel last year when that was going on? You know, and they were just, you could just see they hung their heads down. They, and, and in the end, what was interesting was they didn't even know why they were doing it. That was what was shocking. It's like they had... Well, I'll tell you why they did it. They didn't realize why. Why they did it, there was a young man who was very charismatic, and he was an inner city kid that thought he wanted to be the next Colin Kaepernick and draw attention to himself and all that stuff. And he starts doing it, and he gets this faction behind him to, to do this. And, um, and, and they didn't know why they did it. They just followed him, you know? And I said, well, shoot them jump over the bridge, you know, you're going to jump. That's what my dad used to say. He said, well, no, you need to figure out why you're doing it. And I, and I said, look, here's why, well, here's why. I said, would you like to know why my beliefs on this and why you may want to stand and, and uh, you know, for the national anthem? And at that point, everyone said, yeah, sure. No one had ever explained it to us. It, almost to the point of like, you're kidding me. Now, the previous head coach, who I didn't know, he was 26 years old, and, he, and I think it was just too much stress to deal with that. So what he did on Veterans Day, the last game of the year, he kept the team in the locker room. Didn't even let them come out. And it was almost a riot in the locker room. It was crazy, these guys. Like, you know, it was, what they were telling me what was going on, I can't imagine being in that locker room with these players that wanted to come out. But the coach said no. And, um, so, because uh, he didn't want to deal with confrontation for whatever reason. So um, I explained to them, you know, why I think you should stand and, uh, and how, and, and, and the reasons uh, of patriotism and why you want to make sure that, you know, when, when you're going into a game, it's not battle, it's not war, it's totally different, you know, it's a game. But, you know, we're fortunate where we live that we get to do this. Because in some countries, you don't. And um, so after explaining all this and bringing up some, some other reasons why, I said, now, how many of you guys in this room, it was like 60 guys, would like to, um, to uh, take a knee? Right? It's, it's your choice to decide. None of them stood up and said they wanted to take a knee. I said, I go, well, let's just check this out. How many of you guys would like to stand for the national anthem uh, the first game of the year and every game thereafter. And everyone stood up and said, yes, that's what we want to do. So we educated them, and then we actually went to the stadium. I had the national anthem playing over the PA system. We brought the helmets out, and you taught them how to put it under their left arm and their right arm over their heart. And we, and most of them had never sang the national anthem. Now they got terrible voices. That's probably why. But then we actually taught them that. If you could imagine on a Saturday afternoon in the heat, August that they're sitting out there and we're, we're practicing it so they could do it correctly on game day and they did and they did it from that point on so it's like now they know and you know and you, you just they're young and, I, and sometimes you just have to teach them because they just don't know and and I thought that was that was good so at least you know a lot of the alums um, 
were, were giving me some real positive response because of that. They'd, you know, we'd have guys in Miami, uh, you know, that played on the 1966 team that would watch the games online and I'd get emails from them and they'd say, hey, you're one and zero. Well, we're actually 0 and one, but it, to him, we were one and zero because they stood for the national anthem. And it's like, oh, okay, this is really good. So we learned, and um, now at least we stabilize things in the program. The issue now is there's just not very many players. The numbers are really low at the college. I mean, just very low. I mean, the the uh, enrollment is, um, I think, in January is like under 500 students, which is not very high. Um, it, it's it's almost alarming. Okay, now. Um, why? Who knows? Uh, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out because we have a really good town and a, and a college that we could sell. And, and what? And the upside of this is that in football, where you are by far, so you understand, in, in, at this level, small college football, it, it is by far the number one revenue generator in the whole college. It's not even close. I mean, football, because it's all based on tuition revenue and the, and the numbers and everything. So um, we are right now in the middle of recruiting. Um, we had a recruiting weekend two weeks ago, and we had 21 young men come in, and 15 of them said they want to come, which is great. I'll meet, I've had a staff meeting this afternoon. We've got over 50 coming in. Uh, on the 26th coming up right now. And um, a lot of players from this region, which is where we recruit heavy, we've been to every high school in Northwest Ohio at least twice since I've gotten here. So we want to get as many local players. And then we, we, we reach out where our assistant coaches all know people. So we're coast to coast. I mean, we, we've got probably the 50-some guys coming in. Uh, 20 of them are flying themselves in with parents and so forth. So we've got a big group coming in. Um, the roster last year was around 65 football players. Um, I would say after the seniors graduated, there's about 25 kids in the program right now, which is not very many. I've only got about seven or eight of them will be seniors next year, so we're really, really young. But uh, we feel very confident we will sign We'll have probably about 120 new players here in August, which for the college is worth millions, right? Like a lot, right? It will literally in one fall take our college from the all time low in enrollment to all of a sudden it's not just stabilizing, it will be thriving and they're gonna have to start talking about building more dormitories because they will be full. Like within 18 months, the dorm, just because of football, will be full at the college, which that's amazing because I've been here for six months and that's it. So we've, we've, we've gone everywhere to find players and, and, and probably the best part of it is, for me, is when you come in and you start looking at some of our, in the past in football, the alarming part was retention was so low. They would come in as freshmen, and the the retention was actually around 16 to 18 percent for them to become sophomores, right? One year to the other. So it's like less than one out of five would stay, right? Now I, we dug a little deeper and looked at it and said, "Whoa, here's what it is." Aha! Uh -huh. The average GPA over the last five years of incoming football players was about a 2.3. Okay, now we've got almost 500 applicants right now in this that we that have applied to Defines College. The average GPA of our of this new class is 3.1. Okay, totally different player that's coming here to get an education and play football. Right? Football gets them here, education, the professors, and student life. We got to keep them here. So I feel confident because as a group the academic strength will be much higher, um, which helps me as a football coach, because what happens is in football, where it's a lot different than when I played, there's a ton of classroom time. You're in meeting rooms, you're showing video of the offense, the defense, special team, you're trying to teach, it's a class. 
and literally we meet with them 20 hours a week just to learn the game of football. Well, the group we just had, it was like I, I'd be talking about something and they didn't know how to take notes and study the game of football. So I'm like, oh my, if you can't study football, how are you gonna do when you're in that math class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday? And they didn't do very good. So it's like now I know if we get guys in that are sharper intellectually, that can handle the academic workload, not only will they stay there, they'll play better on Saturdays because they'll actually know what to do and do it. So I think that that's where we're pushing towards right now. I think it's going to be exciting to watch these guys play uh, because uh, not only are they a lot higher academics, uh, but they just look like football players. I'm telling you. And we've got offensive linemen that won't fit through that door. 6'6", 310 pounds, walking through the door. I mean, there, we've got guys that you will be shocked. Uh, I'm shocked uh, of, of, of how great a job our assistant coaches have done to bring these guys here onto campus. So the only thing is they're going to be 18, 19 years old. So like 80, 90% of this team will be freshmen, really young. So they've got growing pains, but we're here for the duration. I mean, we're here to get this done. I want to coach my son Eli someday. So that's why we're doing this. So we're going to build this up. It'll be a lot of fun. I urge you to come to games in the fall. We'll make sure I can get a list. I'll get you a schedule, you know, of, uh, and, and get some people from, you know, this area here. I, um, you know, just as, a, as an aside, then if you got any questions, you can ask. When I went to Capitol, like, so my, this newfangled, believe it or not, it's a phone, this uh, watch phone thing, my wife got me, it's, it's been blowing up since I got here, because I had like two college buddies that I was in a fraternity with that grew up around here. So I thought, well, wow, this is crazy. Because I, I called a buddy, I said, do you know, I'm going to Hicksville, and I remember these two guys, one guy named Scott Decker, the other one's named Todd Stout. And I went to college at Capitol with them, and they're, not, they're like, texting me stuff, and um, they, you know, they're saying, well, you know, Scott Decker grew up, he goes, he's gonna drive through Sherwood on the way there. I said, yes, I did. And then he goes, well, there's a Kate, there was an old, I guess it was Case International Harvester there. Well, his parents owned that, his family owned that. Okay, so that was the, the Decker family. So they were there, and, and then Todd Stout grew up, and literally, he says here, in the metropolis of Farmer. <laughs> okay, so, and they both went to Fairview High School. That's where they went to high school. So they're fraternity buddies, and they're all like, I'll see them Saturday at the Columbus Blue Jackets game next Saturday. So I haven't seen these guys in years, but, you know, we're in, I'm in their neck of the woods, so when I drive out of here, I'm going to stop in downtown, take a picture, and put it right on the text message, and yes, I was here, okay? So, uh, you know, it's sort of neat. You, you never know. You, you go all around the country, and then you end up here with, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, soon to be friends and fans of your program. And I just, you know, just give these guys a chance. I can't guarantee we're gonna win a bunch of games next year because we will be the youngest team in America. There's no doubt about it. But they'll play hard, they'll be able to go to class, they'll do things the right way. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's the plan. We will, the plan, we will win championships here, you know, and then, I'm crazy enough where I think middle of the season I scheduled Mount Union for a home and home. So this freshman class will go to Alliance and then they're going to come back and play us in four years and they'll come back. So, you know, I figure if you want to be the best, you better beat the best. So we're going to we're going to keep building these young guys up and do some amazing things on the way. So uh, they're great. And we're about to be there. So, I, you know, if you've got any questions, that's my story for the moment. I hope it was a little entertaining. Anything? Yes? Yeah, I wonder, Coach, you've been around football a long, long time. I wonder if you might speak about this whole, in, this whole thing about head injuries and where you kind of see this, this going in terms of yeah. participation and, and players actually playing football like, like they used to. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, I actually, it's a little close to me because the guy, you know, the movie concussion? Okay, the, the, uh, the physician in it and, and the, the team doctor is with the Steelers. Is, like, I know him. I mean, you grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia. The, the Concussion Institute is in Wheeling, right across the river from where I grew up. And a lot of this stuff, according to them, okay, because I'm not a neurologist, okay, I just know 
it, it's a great game. Football is a great game. And what what I've gotten out of them is that the the football side is the least of our worries. Actually, soccer and women's soccer is the highest concussion sport in the United States. Well, they don't wear headgear and they run around, they fall, and they get hit. So soccer has way more concussions per players than football, at least the kids are protected with a helmet. Now, the rules have changed. You see all the targeting penalties, and, and they're getting rid of the, the head in the game. When I played, you led with your head, you know? Now, we teach a totally different way to tackle. It's almost like wrestling, you know? It's like, you're, it's rugby tackling is what you're doing. So you're teaching them to take a guy down, just like I was a high school, I wrestled in high school and used to coach wrestling. So it's like we're teaching them in a similar way. You get your head to the side, and you take the, take the guy down. It could still be, a, it's still a very fast game, but the concussions have gone down dramatically. I mean, like in the last three years. And I think that's gonna help the game. I, you know, I, you know, like with my son, my wife says, well, when can he play football? You know, I said, let's let him grow up, you know, and, and quit playing Fortnite, you know, and let's, you know, which is this video game these kids play all the time. And, uh, but let, let's get him out and exercise. I want him, I wish, like I keep looking for parks that kids go out and they have pickup games like when I grew up. You just don't see it very much. So we're, you gotta try to do some things like that because nowadays your kid, a kid can't even go, they don't have anybody to play with. That's why they're online all the time. So that's why they sign up for, you know, baseball and all these, and all these uh, sports that are organized. And as long as the coaches are good, it's great. Um, football, I think, is, uh, it, it's got to be the coaches that are working with those young kids. That's that's where the future of this is. And we, as an outreach, is the American Football Coaches Association, which runs all of football coaching. We have a lot of programs out there to educate our youth league coaches in uh, in tackling, you know, which is where a lot of this stuff comes from. So I think we're taking the head out of the game. Um, it's the sports that don't wear helmets are the ones that are alarmed. It, this isn't just because I'm a football coach. I looked at it hard because I've got a six-year-old who I know will be a linebacker. I just know it. I just know what he likes to do. You know, even you know, when he's playing the video games, he gets upset. Well, so we, we buy him a speed bag, and he goes and hits the speed bag when he loses in Fortnite. You know, so that's what he does. So he's a physical little guy, you know. But um, I want to make sure it's safe for him in the future. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. You should take out the Super Bowl who ought to be in the Super Bowl. Wow, that's a tough one. You know, growing up in, you know, I grew up a Steeler fan. Go away. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I grew up a Steeler fan where I, you know, it's 45 minutes from Pittsburgh. And then, um, you know, so it's hard for me to like the Patriots because <laughs> of that, you know. I can respect the Patriots because I look at Tom Brady and say, holy smokes, how did you do that? And then when I see how he ran in the combine, he looked, didn't even look like an athlete. And I'm He's become, because of Bill Belichick, he's become, it was like the perfect storm. The right quarterback, the right coach, very tough, very tough to beat. Um, I, you know, I look at that thing and I think, I don't know that a young guy like Sean McVay is gonna be able to out-coach Bill Belichick. I think it's gonna be tough. He's got the players, but then you look at that last game for the Patriots and they never got to the quarterback. I mean, the D-line never got to him. So obviously they figured out protection and they do the one thing I think in the, at the pro level you have to do is run the football. And they're with the Patriots and so you think they're a passing team and they are marching the ball down the field with kids like Burkhead, you know, and then Devlin, the two kids are like the fullbacks and type guys and they're moving the ball. I don't know how you beat the Patriots. I, I don't know how you beat them right now. I don't necessarily want them to win. But it just looks like it would be it would be a big deal if the Rams can pull this thing off. So we'll see. That's my spin on it. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Don't bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much. Uh, please stand.